let's start, shall we? Let's start. And if you have any questions or queries, uh, pop them up on Facebook, and uh, I'll try and address them as we're going. So what is biblical theology? Um, that's going to be our first hurdle that we need to try and navigate, negotiate this evening. Because there's going to be definitions that actually, in a weird way, are not super helpful. So historically, giving you some background to the term and kind of the idea of it as sort of an explicit study of an explicit thing, category of theology called biblical theology, uh, it kind of gets some energy um, in the 40s, 50, 1940s, 50s and 60s. I re suddenly realized you've got to do the century in this kind of thing as well. And it was part of um, Protestant evangelical theology. It was, it was at least partially an attempt to overcome what was seen as the difference between uh, systematic Catholic theology and the Protestant evangelical theology that was so dominant at the time. And the hope, the hope was that if we return to Scripture, we might find the common ground and we can start to stitch together uh, these two streams of theology. Um, and the idea was, and it, and it, um, it had certain themes built into it. So the idea was, one, that the Bible is a theological resource. So that is that its primary uh, function is to communicate perhaps about God. So although it might also communicate about history, it might also communicate about uh, narrative structures, it might also communicate about, you know, looking at Paul's letters, uh, letter writing in, um, you know, the Hellenistic period. Its primary function was to communicate theological messages. The next thing that it had uh, was an idea of the unity of the Bible. So that is uh, that it saw an overarching arch of meaning and intent and uh, in Scripture. Uh, and, you know, um, if we actually look at the way the Bible is formed in um, just kind of your if, if you pick up a Bible, uh, and it starts with Genesis, which is about the beginnings. It kind of runs through a history of Israel, through time, we get to Christ, and then we get the outworkings of the Christ event up to Revelation, which is, in a sense, the end of time. That's kind of a technical term in some contexts, but that's not how I mean it. Um, so that, so, that, so it, it, it has a unified structure across that time period. Uh, it looks particularly for the revelation of God in history, uh, and it recognizes the uniquely, um, and the term they use is Hebraic, uh, mentality in the Bible. Uh, and that it also suggests that the Bible is a unique revelation of God. So it, it gives to the Bible a particular uniqueness of, in, in Scripture. So that's kind of the background, and as I said, it was a pretty dominant thing uh, as, a, as a study in the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, in this kind of Protestant evangelical setting, primarily in the States. So what I want to do is I want to look at a couple of definitions uh, first, to explore them and uh, just to kind of see their common themes. And they come primarily from this moment, if you will. Although, if you've got your, uh, if you've got your notes, that's what we're calling them, uh, at least some of them are kind of slightly more modern. So, Gerhardus Voss uh, is the first person I've got a definition there, suggests that biblical theology is that branch of exegetical theology which deals with the process of the self-revelation of God deposited in the Bible. So, there's some pretty technical language there. So exegetical theology is the idea that 
we go to the Bible and we we excavate it in a sense uh, and we, we we get information out of it um, and he also understands there that process and it's very important here uh, so process in this instance looks at a an across time nature of it so um, in a sense this deals with a number of people express sort of a concern with uh, the God of the Old Testament if you will and they say look this is a process of revelation of God uh, they also it also kind of addresses the question of why are some things um, not allowed in the Old Testament that are allowed in the New Testament it's process so it kind of has this uh, timely nature to it, this linear time nature to it. Self-revelation uh, of God deposited in the Bible. So it sees that this is kind of God's authoring of, or re in that sense. Um, Steve Wellam contends that the Bible as unified scripture is not just one interpretive option among others, but that which corresponds to the nature of the text itself given its divine inspiration. So here we get a kind of a, a bit of a doubling down, a bit of a re-emphasizing on the idea that uh, the Bible, because it has one divine author. Now, you know, there's no argument there that Paul didn't write Paul's letters or that, um, you know, that some components of the Bible are written by other people, were literally penned. But this is around the idea of inspiration and authority and that kind of authorship. Uh, and so it, for, for Wellam, he contends that this is, in a sense, you should read the Bible as, in a sense, a single text because it has a single author. Uh, and Goldsworthy, who I think is actually um, an Australian, it suggests that you know, biblical theology is not concerned to state the final doctrines which go to make up the content of Christian belief. So biblical theology in theory isn't about trying to make a final argument for uh, the Trinity or, or um, make a final argument for how God uh, might be within God's self or express perhaps even the, the two or threefold nature of Christ. Rather, it's it's a it's a different thing. It's a, it's about uh, kind of charting the journey, um, and it's about charting the process by which revelation unfolds and moves towards the goal, which is God's final revelation of His purposes in Jesus Christ. Okay, so now that's a couple of um, definitions of what biblical theology is, uh, and. I suppose there are some things there that I want to highlight uh, and suggest that maybe there are a problem. Maybe there are a problem. Uh, so the first thing to be honest about uh, is, is that it might actually not be possible structurally to do authentic biblical theology, by which I mean it might not be possible for us to let the Bible speak and reveal its own themes, because we just don't understand it anymore. We don't speak the language. And I'm not talking exclusively about the fact that the Old Testament is written primarily in Hebrew uh, and the New Testament is written in um, Koine Greek. Uh, but even if we do speak, even if we, you know, even if I had been paying enough attention uh, in my studies to speak both biblical Hebrew and you know, I mean, of course, that's a cross. That's a pretty dodgy concept because uh, it's uh, you know it's, it's evolved over time. If my group, if my biblical Greek was so brilliant that I could you know be time traveled back to the time of Jesus and no one would even tell I had an accident, an accent. I still don't speak the language because I'm, you know, I, I, I'm kind of modern slash postmodern. I studied math and science at school. Um, I, I, all these sorts of things. Language and concepts have shifted substantially. 
So I have to ask the question, and it is an authentic and it's a serious question, if it's even possible to do biblical theology in kind of its most stark form. So that's the first thing I would, I would, I would ask the question of. And I, I, th I think that's probably one of the biggest potential hurdles. Is, you remember earlier I was talking about exegesis and how exegesis is about this idea that we uh, go and we let the text speak for itself and we excavate from it. Um, eisegesis is the opposite. It's where we take our ideas and concepts and we put them back into Scripture and then we, surprise, surprise, find them revealed there. Um, and you can find pretty much anything revealed there if you know what to look for. So, um, and you, you have an idea of going in. So that's the first question. Um, the next, the next sort of uh, critique of the idea of sort of biblical theology is that it becomes, with potentially, a sophisticated form of idolatry or bibliolatry. I've heard it referred to. So, because it takes the Bible as a one voice self revelation of God. It becomes, in essence, God, you know, um, and it very easily could become a, uh, yeah, it could just be, you know, it becomes the idol. Um, and in a way, you kind of get this, you know, um, when uh, you see people saying things like, oh, in the Bible it says, and I believe it. It's like, well, one, the Bible is actually a very complex text, potentially. Uh, but from within that perspective, it's not. Because it's the self-revelation of God, it's not an inherently complex text. It's, an, in fact, inherently a... a, 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 a yeah. And when, you compare, and when you add that to us bringing modern and perhaps postmodern questions, it becomes particularly complicated. So... Uh, but, but it, 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 it can make the text God as opposed to, um, yeah. And from my perspective, from my perspective, in the Bible, we, we are encouraged to consider the leading of the Holy Spirit uh, kind of as the church develops. And so if we are, in the most rigorous sense, invoking uh, biblical theology, we prevent uh, these other options, the, these other avenues for for exploring scripture. So, so I, I think it's 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 potentially a problem there. Um, I kind of foreshadowed uh, my third, what I think is a fairly significant concern, uh, and it that is the. Um, that biblical theology traditionally sees uh, Scripture as being monovalent, one-voiced, uh, and it is essentially the voice of God. And um, I feel like I should do that in a deep voice. It's the voice of God, um, because kind of that's how people think these things through in a weird way. Um, and what that does is it covers over the fact that there are many different views, perspectives, questions that are being asked. Uh, more modern uh, theologians and biblical theologians and biblical exegetes will talk uh, differently. And what they will do is they will say things like, uh, you know, in Paul's theology or in uh, the theology in Colossians or the Psalms or in the Gospel of Mark. And that's... Uh, that's one response to that question. But what that also does is it undermines the kind of the one-voiced nature of it and the process of it. It becomes, um, in a way, it becomes like, uh, you know, when you see a film, a movie, it's X number of frames per second, 16 or 24 or whatever. Uh, and what we do when we look at, say, just Paul's theology is we start to, uh, by highlighting that, we also drop its processness. I just made up a word. Um, so it's 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 strengths and weaknesses. 
I would probably myself find the last view a more helpful one. But let's be aware that it doesn't then answer some of the previous questions. Okay, so I've done a little bit of work on kind of defining biblical theology. I've um, and kind of its historical background. Uh, I also want to say that in a sense, uh, one of the reasons it's so complex is everybody thinks they're doing it right. Um, you, you can't imagine anyone sort of writing a serious theology that says, "Well, I totally ignored the Bible and instead I went with Moby Dick." as my basis for my theology. And, and, and I say that without having any concerns with Moby Dick or, or, or any of those other sort of classical literature texts. But it's, it becomes so important when we're talking about the nature of God, uh, particularly from within a Christian and, and a Jewish perspective, um, but nobody's going to say, my theology is unbiblical. Uh, so it becomes a, a very complex thing. But, uh, so I suppose my next question here, well, my next thing that I want to kind of put forward is why might we do biblical theology? Um, especially as perhaps it's impossible, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, and partially because I don't think it's like, uh, you know, in the, um, like the James Bond movies, they're running across the rooftop and you jump from one roof to the other. And it's very exciting and there's usually exciting music. And if you don't make the jump, you plummet to your death, right? Well, I don't think this is like that. We're, I don't think this is the, one of those situations where if we don't make the jump all the way, that we're uh, inherently missing out or we're inherently and fundamentally harmed. Uh, I think this is more like um, justice or beauty, where just because we don't get there, you know, um, the law is supposed to... Wibbly wobbly. Timey-wimey! Sorry about that. Uh, the law is supposed to help us get to uh, justice, but it, it, it's also inherently not there yet. Uh, you know, um, paintings are often designed to reflect beauty, and yet they're not beautiful, or well, they're not beauty itself. Um, and, and so I, I think just because we don't get there doesn't mean it's not a worthy goal. Um, and so why might it be a worthy goal? The, the first one for me, and this is, um, in a sense, one of the biggest, uh, is when we think about the historical conversation partners for theology, um, and I, I've used the example here of Greek philosophy. So in the early years, uh, as Christian theology was developing, its significant conversation partner was Greek philosophy. Which makes sense if you think about it. It, it, Christianity expanded very quickly through the Roman world in its early years, uh, and the other sort of really dominant thinking school or culture at that time was the Greek philosophers. The Romans were basically Greek philosophy, using Greek philosophy as well, um, and this led to th certain theological structures. And I've got a quote there by Epicurus. And Epicurus is offering uh, the classical, in a sense, question of evil. Um, and he said, is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he's not omnipotent. Is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whereeth cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? Can you see the question there? Uh, it's a classical question of evil. Um, Epicurus is not the only person to have raised that as a topic. But what happens is that in raising the question, Epicurus also gets to define God, right? God is omnipotent, benevolent, uh, omnipotent, omniscient, and benevolent. You know, otherwise he's not God. Um, so so uh, Epicurus gets to, to kind of define God. And that leads to certain problems. I mean, one, it leads to a problem with this kind of definition of the problem of evil. Um, and that's not to say there aren't responses to that. But even if we were to look at kind of a, 
uh, the most classic biblical theology of looking at the structure and the defining characteristics of God. Well, in, in Scripture, it starts with God as creative, not necessarily omnipotent, just powerful enough to create the universe, which is pretty powerful. Um, but, you know, we, it, it's, we, we get that. Um, we might have God as being personal, and we, we kind of see various pictures and depictions of God. Uh, and, but having as the dominant conversation partner Greek philosophy, we ran into these problems. And it's not the only example. Um, the other example I came across recently, uh, interestingly, it's still to do with God and creation, is the, you may have heard of the argument from design. You know, the idea that if we look at the universe, uh, it so clearly has a form and a function. You know, if you were to come across a watch in a desert, even though there's no watchmaker there, you would look at the design. It clearly has a function, a purpose. Its design is integrated. Uh, it can't not, you know, and it's got to point to a, a designer. The problem with that is, once again, engineering gets to define the terms we, we use for God. So in that definition, that story, um, God is a supreme engineer. God is a supreme designer and, and those sorts of things. Rather than being, um, you know, perhaps some other way we might want to, to talk about God, you know, once again, going back to the creation story, um, in Genesis chapter 1, God creates by speaking. So we don't, in, in the metaphor, we don't, you know, if we came across a painting, we'd clearly say, oh, look, there's a painter. We use the metaphor of a watch. We use the metaphor of an engineer, uh, of a mechanic, of an artificer, not a poet or a, or a, or a song. So, so once again, the new conversation partner of science starts to define the terms that we bring to God. And that can be a problem. That can be a problem. It means we miss certain things because the lens that we use is from another discipline. And the hope would be that in biblical theology, we actually allow the lens of scripture to reveal something of the nature of God. Uh, that's a, yeah, So that's uh, one reason why we might do it is, is to kind of, be far more aware of our conversation partners. Uh, so the next reason why I might propose that we would uh, want to do biblical theology, even despite the various different challenges to it, um, is that it brings fresh insights. So if you look at the little picture there, which kind of looks like a, just a, a red rainbow, if you've got the notes, um, what that is, is it's a, it's linking up all the verses in the Bible that contradict each other. Uh, and it's, it's, it, it comes from, uh, Sam Harris, who's a fairly famous, uh, new atheist. Um, and it's, it's, it, I think it's quite fascinating actually. Now it becomes a problem if you are committed to the idea that the Bible has only one author who is infallible and so every verse, you know, no verses can contradict or anything like that. Uh, which is only, which is actually only a fairly small section uh, of the Christianity of Christian approaches. But one of the reasons I like that, I, I think it is a deeply powerful tool, is because of what it does is it points us to all the places in Scripture where we get more than one voice, where we get two or three or four people going, hey, here's a different picture of this. Uh, here's a different picture of, of how we engage with God. Here's a different picture of how God engages with us. Here's a different view of the nature of God, of Christ, of time, of, of whatever. Uh, and so this becomes... For me, I, I would suggest a very rich resource for uh, paying attention to the various voices 
within scripture. Um, yeah, so, but we, we need to pay attention. So that's uh, something there. The third reason that I think biblical theology is so important, uh, and this is my final point, uh, is that I, most of the deeply productive theological schools of modern times are, are actually um, explosions from other parts of theology where they have grappled with the text, where they've actually read scripture and they have to kind of try to try to reconcile it with the world that they saw and they said it just doesn't fit and so this uh, new way of doing things emerges and it emerges from within scripture it emerges from a deep engagement with scripture um, you know and, and and I would suggest you know, liberation theology, process theology, radical theology, they all, in essence, emerge from, or at least take deeply seriously, uh, engagement with Scripture. Uh, and, you know, liberation theology, I think, is probably the one that deserves kind of the... It's earned the biggest nod here, because it's the one that... Uh, <clears throat> That has had the biggest impact on the world. You know, it is liberation theology gave birth to feminist theology to a certain sense. Uh, it, it inspired various forms of liberation theology around the world, black theology in Southern Africa, in in the United States. Uh, you know, it, it really has shaped this, and it's shaped this by giving a structure, a, a theory to why the voices of those who are or poor and dispossessed should be listened to. Now, you know, to us these days, because we've been shaped by this to a certain extent, that might not be super shocking, but for kind of historically, that's quite an important thing. Um, and and it comes from a deep reading of scripture, uh, you know, and the, and the suggestion there, um, and this just comes from Wikipedia. Uh, it's an attempt to return to the gospel of the early church, uh, where Christianity is politically and culturally decentralized, and is suspicious of the empire. You know, um, and and that so that's where that comes from, I suppose. So, so that's biblical theology. Uh, it's a very quick introduction. I'll, I'll quickly summarize. So. Background, in theory, biblical theology is about allowing the Bible to speak. Um, uh, yeah, it's about allowing the Bible to speak in its historical context to our present context, uh, but not allowing our present context to dominate the conversation. It has some possible problems. It does. Um, not least the fact that, hey, a minimum of 2,000 years, well, 1,900 years has passed since it was written in various formats, you know, some of it much older than that. Um, there are forms of it that would raise the text to a, a, the role of idol. Um, and some approaches to biblical theology are monovalent. They're only one, they only really allow one voice. Uh, and so there's a kind of a smoothing out of any of the differences of opinion it's still very important still has a lot to offer uh, you know um, it allows us to be aware of where we're engaging with conversation partners it in, in, inspires fresh insights um, not the least of these that those that can change the world okay Whew. I feel like that was a lot of information in a fairly short space of time uh, 